Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. You know what else? Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. This episode is the sixth episode of a nine-part series on Uruguayan wine. These are all free samples, so I have total autonomy in these reviews. Be sure to watch the first episode of the series for a more in-depth feature on Uruguayan wine. The short version is that wine has certainly been made in Uruguay since the early 1600s. However, it's not until about 1870 that the modern wine industry really begins in Uruguay. Today's wine comes from Vina Progresso in the Canelones department of Uruguay. This winery is Gabriel Pisano's Bodega Experimental, or Experimental Winery. It's basically part of Bodega Pisano. Gabriel traveled the world for a little bit to learn some to learn from some pretty incredible winemakers in Chile, Sonoma, South Africa, and the Priorat region in Spain. He also studied enology at the Uruguayan Vine and Wine School. Vina Progresso has two main lines of wine, overground and underground. The difference between the two is that overground wines are more, quote, civilized, I guess, as in more approachable using more well-known international varieties whereas the Underground series is edgier, I guess, with more experimentation than the Overground. At least that's how I interpret it. The Overground wines are also produced more often than the Underground wines. Either way, they are trying to avoid replicating another wine's region's style, but stay true to their terroir as it really should be. The vineyard is divided into small plots of high density planting of 5,000 vines per hectare. This is combined with low yields of 8,000 to 10,000 kilograms per hectare or 3.34 to 4.05 tons per acre. The average vine age is 10 to 30 years. Soil, like I've mentioned, is, did I already mention the soil? Maybe I've mentioned it in the other episodes, but I haven't mentioned it yet. Soil is a calcareous clay. After harvest, the grapes go through a cold maceration for, in stainless for four to six days. He uses a combination of native and non-native native yeasts, depending on the lot. The wine goes through a temperature-controlled fermentation maceration, like most wines, for about 20 days, and they use both pump-overs and punch-downs by hand as needed. Then the wine gets split into French and American oak barrels. The rest of the wine presumably stays in stainless steel or uh, is moved to another tank. Aging is about five to seven months in barrel. The wine goes through a light filtration before bottling. Okay, here are the stats for the wine. The 2020 Vigna Progresso Overground Cabernet Franc suggested retail price is $26. It's from Canelones. It's 100% Cabernet Franc. Uh, hand harvested, I'm pretty sure that's it's done that way. Uh, there's no mention, but I kind of feel like they do that. Maceration, 20 days. Partially aged five to seven months in French and American oak, second use from what I can tell. Light filtration, and the ABV is 14%. All right, let's get into the wine. Cabernet Franc from Uruguay. That is pretty darn cool. I'm excited to try this. I have, I mean, this whole series is just want me trying wines I've never tried before from Uruguay. I mean, it's been Tanat, 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 oh, an Albarino here. And, you know, in, in the past. And now I'm getting, you know, all this other cool stuff. I will say this. Um, so when I got the initial, when I got the initial email back in December about these wines, um, they talked about that Marcelon is a grape that's been uh, getting planted in Uruguay. So I just, I just assumed that one of the wines was going to be Marcelon and unfortunately none of them were. And, and there's two sets of wines. So it wasn't like I got the set without the Marcelon. There's no Marcelon in either of the sets, but that's okay. I'm super excited about trying Cabernet Franc from Uruguay. All right. Oh, what I was going to do. Yes. Uh, turn on, do not disturb again. <laughs> So um, normally I do these reviews at like, you know, midnight, one, two in the morning. So Do Not Disturb isn't exactly the most 
important thing for me to do, but it's uh, just before nine o'clock. Not that I my phone blows up or anything, but you just never know. I just didn't want to get interrupted with stuff. This has been an all day event, uh, all day affair today. So I'm on, this is, uh, I have this one and three more to do, and I'm done with the majority of the stuff I plan to do. Let's just, let's get into the wine, man. I'm just excited to try Cabernet Franc. Haven't had any Cap Franc in a little while. All right, so uh, I'd call it medium on the, uh, you know, medium intensity. It's more of a deep or dark ruby color, but you know, there's a little bit of see-through to this, but not a lot. Um, really very little staining on the glass. You know what I haven't done for the entire series? Look at the tearing. Uh, I mean, I know it's 14% ABV and it acts like a 14 percenter. So let's just get a little nose action here. So I get some darker fruits, a little bit of uh, violet, some red flower, purple flower thing going on here. There's a bit of florality to it. Cabernet Franc will have that floralness to it. There's a rusticness, a rusticity, a garage that I got to use a couple wines ago. Um, a little bit earth, but it's not really overwhelming on the nose. Um, there's no overt oak aromas. Like I said, this is, that's why I also think this is like a second use oak or third use. It's, it's used barrels. It's not brand new. We could even be talking neutral, which would be third or fourth use and, and, and more. Yeah, it's like a little bit of red fruit too. So it was a darker fruit, but I've also got some more red fruit and it's just a generic color. I don't have a specific fruit right now. When I get on the palate, I'll look for that. There's a bit of tobacco to it. Um, not quite green tobacco, but like a tobacco thing to it. What I am looking for is the characteristic of pyrazine, which is a greenness, usually in the form of bell pepper or jalapeno or fern. Um, and I'm not getting that, which is fine. This is not necessarily a cool climate area, but it is near the coast. So let's uh, check it out. It's tasty. So I've got darker fruit, red and black fruit. Um, I would say more raspberry, more red on the fruit than black fruit, but I've got the raspberry blackberry thing going on. There is an, a non-fruit quality to it, a, an earth kind of thing. Um, a little bit, I guess, kind of herbaceous type of thing. I guess kind of the garage, the garage, whatever. There's what I associate with stemminess. I have no idea if these are destemmed or not. They probably are, but I don't know. It, a lot of times when winemakers are using whole bunch or whole cluster, or in other words, they leave the stems, it's not, it's not destemmed. They tell you, but they don't always tell you. I do get that red flower or really more purple flower. So you get that violet coming through. It's a little bit of a potpourri action. Yeah, that rusticity is coming through. There's some good tannin coming through here. Um, it is very, it acts very much like an old world wine. So in my tasting group, one of the things that we will call Cabernet Franc um, in a way to kind of differentiate it between Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and it's really more in the old world set, uh, setting and really in France because Cabernet Franc is from France is really the only one we have to really worry about. Like I'm not going to get asked about, well, for, I'm never going to ask anything about Uruguay though. To not could be something in the future I get asked for. Um, but when we're talking to Cabernet Franc specifically, we're normally going to call Loire Valley. We could call right bank Bordeaux. Uh, but we're normally going to call Loire Valley, and we are usually looking for that pyrazine. But we also will say it, it acts like a poor man's Bordeaux. And it's a really bad phrase to use because you're making it sound like Cabernet Franc cannot be made in a high quality wine. It can absolutely be made high quality, even in the Loire Valley, especially the Loire Valley. But what happens is that 
Bordeaux has this I guess reputation of like lots of oak or if they're going to use oak it's going to be like new barrel of course french so there's going to be more of a polish to it um and since new oak is expensive if you're using older oak you're not spending as much money on on the wine so therefore a quote poor man's cabernet sauvignon or poor man's bordeaux um so with all that said this acts very much like a Loire Valley, Cabernet Franc, something like Chinon or um, Bourguil and or Bourguil. I think it's Bourguil is the right way. Anyway, but without the piercings, which does happen, we will get Loire Valley, Cabernet Francs that ripened, the piercing ripened out. So I feel like that that's what I'm getting. I'm getting something like that. Now, granted, I just said he's not trying to make a wine that, that's just like anywhere else, and you shouldn't. But we always compare wines, even if we say we're not. There's always a comparison with what we consider the originals, um, where the wine is best known to come from. And there is a bit of that. There's a bit of old world style winemaking going on here. But the fruit is a little bit riper. Um, I can feel the 14%. It's not out of balance. It's definitely in balance. You feel it just a little bit. The tannin is not, matter of fact, I don't even, tell, I don't even feel the tannin anymore, which Cabernet Franc doesn't necessarily hit you in the face with tannin. I mean, the fruit's coming out a little bit more on the aromas, and it does present itself to be a little more ripe in, in nature. And there is that tobacco. It's kind of that borderline between green like newer tobacco like you know unripe tobacco and ripe dried tobacco so it's on that kind of in between area and the fruit now is starting to become a little more noticeable but there is that herbaceousness to it um that non that non uh, fruit quality to it i wouldn't necessarily call it earthiness but there is a bit of that like force for I think it's a really well-made wine. I really like it. It's a little light, um, which is fine. I mean, it's a more of a medium, almost medium minus on the body. Um, I feel like this is one of these wines, like I had, I've had a lot of these, uh, seems like I've had a lot of wines today as a category, not just Uruguay, um, where I would say, I need food with this. Like it needs food to really kind of shine a little bit more. It's, it's, not um, necessarily a solo act. And so I think it's a well-made wine. It's a little bit reserved. It's a little more elegant. It doesn't punch you in the face. So it's one of those things where you kind of have to go, huh, all right, let's, uh, let's pay attention to it. I think it's well-made. I, I enjoy it. Yeah. All right, so that's gonna do it for today's show. If you like what I'm doing, if you're enjoying everything, please make sure you hit that like button and subscribe and then tell your friends and we'll see you next time.